Well, thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. As always say, it is such a joy and a privilege to be able to come to you with the Word of God wherever you may be watching and listening. And we do ask that as we try to preach the Word of God each week that you will pray for us. And it is just our prayer that the Word of God will be a blessing to you wherever you may be. And it's our our goal here to try to get the Word of God out to sinners and saints alike and that people would be reached with the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Just by way of reminder, we can be heard every Sunday morning from 7.30 to 8 a.m. on WRMG Radio 97.9 FM and AM 1430. Uh, You can watch us every Sunday morning from 7.30 to 8 a.m. on TV Channel 12, which covers the Red Bay area on Mac South Cable, and you can watch us also on TV Channel 97, which covers the Tishomingo County on Mac South Cable. And then, of course, you can always find us on Jack Ivey's uh, Facebook page and YouTube channel, and you can find us on Facebook by simply searching Rightly Divided Radio Ministry. And so we're just so grateful that we have the opportunity to come to you with the Word of God and do ask uh, that you would pray for us as we preach each week. Well, let's go to the, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we look to the Word of God. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be here this morning and to have this time, Lord, to open your Word. And Lord, it's my prayer that as we open the Word of God that we would hear from you in your Word. Lord, I know that preaching is not about my opinion, Lord. Preaching is not about what I have to say. But Lord, it's about what you have to say and us hearing from your Word. And so I pray, Lord, that you would help us to rightly divide the Word of truth. Help us, Father, not to preach with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but help us, Father, to preach under the demonstration and power of the Spirit of God. And I pray that, Lord, wherever the Word of God may go forth, Lord, you said that it will not return void. And I pray that that would be so this morning. And pray, Lord, that sinners who hear the gospel will turn to Christ and know Him in the great work of salvation. And those of us who are born again, Father, as always pray, sanctify us by your word, God, mold us into your image, I pray. Thank you, Father, above everything for saving us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as, as some of you may know, we have been looking at a series of messages entitled Walking with Our Lord to Calvary. And what we are doing is we are looking at the last couple of days in the life of the Lord Jesus. We began that by looking at the last Passover meal that Jesus shared with the disciples. And there he, began, he explained what the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup represented. He washed the disciples' feet as John records. And then the Bible teaches us that he walked with the disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he prayed with the Father in agony. And we were able to see there the beginning of his, as he says, his exceeding sorrow that he was experiencing there as he prayed to the Father that God would, if there would be some way to have that cup pass from him. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And then, of course, it was there in the Garden of Gethsemane that Judas led uh, the Roman soldiers to where Jesus was, and there they captured him. And that was where we left off. So the last place that we looked in was... uh, I believe it was the Gospel of Mark, and we looked at the betrayal. And now we are getting into the trials of that, that Jesus uh, went through. There were six trials that Jesus went through. There were uh, three Jewish trials, and then there were three Roman trials. And we're going to begin uh, this morning uh, by basically looking at the second part of Jesus' trial that he went through while He is here before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. Of course, where we are right now, we're going to be in Matthew's Gospel in chapter number 26. And uh, this trial that we're going to look at, we're not going to look at all six phases of the trial. We're going to look at maybe three or four of them. uh, Because we know that first, Jesus was took to Annas according to John's Gospel. In the 18th chapter, John tells us that he was taken from the garden to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, and then... Uh, Anna sends him to Caiaphas where we are here in Matthew's Gospel chapter number 26. And so we want to begin here and we want to uh, begin looking in verse number 57 of Matthew 26. And so the word of our God says this, And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas the high priest where the scribes and the elders were assembled. 
But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace, and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet they found they none. At the last came two false witnesses, and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness, witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? So again, this that we have read is the second part of, of, of really the Jewish trial where Jesus meets with Caiaphas and they meet in secret at night. This is Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Of course, uh, we refer to the trials of Jesus as unjust. They are un, the unfair trials of the Lord Jesus because they're, they're really, as, as Pilate says, Pilate even said that he could find no fault with Jesus. And so uh, even in this story, as we look here, they're trying to find uh, false witnesses. In other words, they're trying to find false witnesses to come up with something that would justify them putting Jesus to death. And, of course, Jesus was guilty of nothing. And so all of these different, tri all of these different trials that Jesus is going to be put through, all of them are done unjustly. They, they have no real reason to actually take and execute Jesus Christ. But nonetheless, this is what really happened in the life of the Lord Jesus. And I just want to remind you again while we're even looking at this so that we can see the real uh, sorrow, the real agony, the, the, the pain that our Lord endured as He made His way to the cross at Calvary. And, and when we get there, when we see the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary, and we see Him enduring that great physical pain, and then we see Him endure the pain of bearing the wrath of God for sins, there we're going to see the height of that. But I don't want us to miss these things that led up to the Lord Jesus being crucified. I don't want us to, to miss that agony that He experienced in the garden of Gethsemane when, when Jesus said that he was exceeding sorrowful over that. I don't want us to uh, miss the, the betrayal, the, 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 one of the most sinful acts in all of humanity that, that Judas committed, the betrayal. And then I don't want us to miss the unfair treatment of the Lord Jesus either. Because I remind you, all of these things happen in accordance with the Word of God. That's why, again, as I mentioned, when we looked at the betrayal, we, we, we wonder about that. Why did the betrayal actually take place? Why was that something that, as the Bible teaches us, was an actual fulfillment of prophecy? And, and Jesus says that it's, it's because the Scriptures are being fulfilled. And so uh, even though we may wonder why a lot of these things did play, take place like they did, it teaches us uh, about the fulfillment of God's divine plan. And then even here we're going to learn about the ultimate gross depravity of man. So I want us to notice, first of all, in this passage, the scheme that took place in these unfair trials, these unjust trials. Again, as I've already mentioned, uh, John's gospel teaches us that he went directly from the garden to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who we have read about here. Of course, we know that Annas was... Uh, the high priest uh, before Caiaphas. As a matter of fact, Annas was the high priest, and then uh, actually it was the Romans who took him out of that office. 
and then his sons succeeded him, and then Caiaphas, his son-in-law. But because it was the Romans that actually took Annas out of office, he was still uh, really respected by the Jewish people, and he had a lot of pull behind the scenes with the Jewish people, and especially the Sanhedrin. And so that's why they took him directly to Annas, because of the leverage, because of the pull, because of the confidence that the Sanhedrin had in him. But then he sends him to Caiaphas. And here where we have been in Matthew 26, as I've already mentioned, this is really illegal. They, they are meeting here at night. They are, they're meeting in secretly because of all the different festivities that are going on and they don't and really not are supposed to be doing this during this time. But nonetheless, they meet here. They bring Jesus before the Sanhedrin illegally. And I, want, I don't want you to miss that what is taking place here is a, it really is a fraudulent trial. This is, a, this is something that, that should have not been done according to, uh, uh, or, or at least by all legal purposes. This was something that should have never taken place. But it's something that did take place. It's something that actually happened in real history. This is not something that the Word of God records to us as some kind of a fable or, 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 or as something that is untrue. This really happened. And, and you may say, well, preacher, I know that this is a fact. I understand, preacher, that this is something that may have really taken place. But what is the real significance of it? Well, I think the significance of this fraudulent trial, this unfair trial that Jesus is enduring here with the Sanhedrin it is really a reminder to us of how really wicked and depraved men really are. Uh, because remember, we know that Jesus is not guilty of anything. We know that Jesus is not guilty of any real crime that deserves execution. Even Pilate is going to say as much. Pilate is going to admit that, that Jesus is really not guilty of anything that is worthy of execution. But we know, as John teaches us, that, that, that Jesus Christ came into His own, the Jewish nation, and His own received Him not. They, they totally rejected Him because He was never the Messiah that they wanted Him to be. He, was not, he did not come in all of His glory, so to speak. He did not come in that great glory that they were looking for to establish His kingdom on earth and to, and to rescue them from Roman oppression. He didn't do what they uh, supposed the Messiah would do because they were seeing farther ahead. But nonetheless, Jesus was the real and true Messiah. Jesus came, uh, obviously, just as the Old Testament prophesied He would come. He came lowly. He came humble. He didn't come here rich. He came here and was born to a poor family. He didn't live a, a rich lifestyle. He lived a very poor life. He lived a humble life, as the Bible so clearly teaches us. And he never did anything wrong. As a matter of fact, Jesus proves to be the most benevolent being, the most gracious, the most merciful being who had ever lived. And even more than that, the most holy and righteous. He was guilty of no sin. There was not one sin that the Lord Jesus had committed. Yet here they are so, uh, they, they hate him so much. As a matter of fact, it was uh, Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin that had been uh, plotting his death all along. And so all of these people here that are involved in the Sanhedrin, the high priest and everybody, are the ones that have been plotting his death. And so this now is just a part of their plan to get rid of the Lord Jesus. Notice what the Word of God teaches us, that the chief priests and elders and all the council, they sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. So not only is this in and of itself a fraudulent trial, an unfair trial, an unjust trial, and that in and of itself is bad enough, but more than that, even in the trial that they give him, again, as I've already mentioned, they don't have any real evidence that Jesus is guilty of anything, if you know anything about the, the, how a Jewish trial would work or a trial in this day would work, as I've already mentioned, you would go through three Jewish trials and then three uh, uh, Roman trials. It was really a, a, a six-part thing. But nonetheless, uh, the, the, the Jewish law was really merciful to criminals in that 
there had to be two or more witnesses. There, there had to be all kinds of evidence to prove that a man was guilty before he would be executed. And, and especially for the Romans, that, uh, for the, uh, because the Jewish people were not actually allowed to execute themselves, they would have had to take plenty of evidence to the Roman uh, government in, in order for the Romans to do the execution. So uh, there had to have all of these things work just perfectly together in order for a criminal to actually be executed. And so here, because they don't have any evidence on the Lord Jesus, the Bible teaches us that they sought false witness against Jesus. In other words, they were trying to find uh, false witnesses. They were trying to find uh, people to come together to, 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 bring up, to, to make up some kind of, of, of crime or, or blasphemy that Jesus had committed. And the Bible teaches us that they couldn't find any, verse number 60, but they found none. And yea, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. In other words, even the false witnesses, even the people that they got together to try to find some kind of false witness against Jesus, they could not even agree upon uh, a, 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 some kind of crime that he had committed. They, they couldn't find any. And then the Bible teaches us that there came two false witnesses, and they said, this fellow, I said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And so now they have found two false witnesses who have come together to say that Jesus has said that he was able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Of course, this was a gross misinterpretation of what Jesus actually meant when he said that he could destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. We know that Jesus was referring to his body. He was referring to his death and res resurrection. Uh, but, but, but here they have, they have uh, a gross uh, misinterpretation of what Jesus has said here. And because of that, even though it is, a, a, even though it is such a, a terrible misinterpretation of what Jesus actually said, the high priest arose, the Bible says, and, 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 and Jesus, the Bible teaches us, has nothing to say about this. We, we, we know that famously Jesus was silent. He doesn't offer any defense of himself. We know that in history, the, uh, during these different trials, uh, especially the, the Jewish part of the trial, that uh, the, 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 the person who is being charged of a crime was always allowed to bring his own defense. In other words, he was able to, he was able to bring uh, uh, people who would witness on his, in his defense, uh, much like a uh, trial that we would have in today's court. So, uh, but Jesus here doesn't say anything to his own defense. We, we know famously that Jesus was silent during all of this. He doesn't say anything to his defense. And you may say, uh, people... Uh, may say, well, he did that because he had nothing to say. But we know that, that, that everything that is going on here, as unfair and as just as it may seem, as twisted as all of this may seem, we know that, uh, that this is all according to the Word of God. This is exactly a, a carry-on of what Jesus told, uh, said in the garden when He was betrayed. All of this happened. All of this was taking place that the Scriptures might be fulfilled. And so Jesus here, uh, again, as we know, He prayed in the garden that God would allow this cup to pass from Him. But He said, Nevertheless, not my will, but Thy will be done. So even though Jesus doesn't say anything here, it, 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 it's not something uh, against Him. He, he's simply not do it. He's not saying anything in his defense because he knows that, 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 his, that, that he is simply doing his part in the plan of redemption. So Jesus here stays silent. He doesn't say anything against what they have said. The Bible says here in, in verse number 63 that Jesus held his peace. So even though there is the false witness against him, the Bible says that Jesus held his peace because he knows that what he is doing is going to bring about redemption. What he is doing is going to bring about salvation in the life of sinners. And Jesus holding his peace has nothing to do with him being guilty, but it has everything to do with him doing what he must do in order for guilty sinners to be justified freely in the sight of God Almighty. Then the Bible teaches us that during all of this, as Jesus held his peace, that the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Now, this is interesting because 
we need to pay attention to what they're saying here. They're wanting to know if what Jesus has said is true, not because they believe it, not because they're trying to inquire as to whether what He has said is true or not. They're not really concerned about that. They're trying to get Jesus to to say something, that they want Him to speak some kind of blasphemy here in the moment. And so they say, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. I want you to notice what Jesus says here. Jesus saith unto them, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Before I get to that, I want us to look at what verse number 65 here says, Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. In other words, the high priest here thinks that he has something on the Lord Jesus. He's saying that the Jesus has spoken blasphemy. In other words, uh, and, that makes him, and that makes him a candidate for execution. But listen what the high priest does here. He rents his clothes... He does this because uh, this was done as a sign of grief here, but, but he's just doing this to put on a show. It's just, it's just so much more proof that everything the Lord is enduring here is so unfair on the part of men. And, and I want to say this because we don't really have much time to get into all of the details of this, but, but I don't want to come here and, 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 and for all of us to, to miss the great importance of what is taking place here. Again, we know that Jesus is, is, is totally innocent. We know that Jesus is not guilty of any, any crime at all. He's not worthy of any kind of execution that they, that, they are, that they are wanting to give Him. But it is a greater reminder of the great depravity and sinfulness of man. Here standing before them is the most uh, holy and righteous being that exists in all of the universe. Here standing before them is is the incarnate one who created the entire world by speaking it into existence. Here standing before them is the most benevolent, merciful, gracious, loving being in all of the universe. And this is the way that they treat Him. And I just want to remind you that this this is exactly what humanity has always done with the holy and righteous God. This is exactly what man, humanity is still doing with the holy and righteous God of the Scriptures. Listen, the world still despises the Lord Jesus. The world still rejects the Lord Jesus. And the world is still trying to do their best to get, uh, to get rid of the Lord Jesus. But, but, but I don't want us to miss what Jesus says here. Even though they are doing their best to get rid of Him, and even though they think that by executing Him, uh, they are getting rid of the Lord Jesus, don't miss what Jesus says here. Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. I want to tell you, this should have been the most fearful words that they heard. These should have been the, the, the these words should have sparked great fear in the in all of the Sanhedrin and all of those who heard this and were plotting his execution. But the truth is, is that their depravity, their blindness, was 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 causing them to to not understand the uh, the the weight of what Jesus is saying here. Because Jesus is reminding them that even though they are trying to get rid of them, and even though in their blindness, and even though in their minds they think that they are getting rid of the Lord Jesus, Jesus reminds them that 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 uh, that they shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds. Of heaven. What Jesus endured here was unfair. It was unjust. What takes place here in, the, in, in this moment of secrecy with the Sanhedrin should have never taken place, but it did. Because this is how depraved and wicked men treat the Lord Jesus. This is what they do with the Lord Jesus who is holy, who is righteous, who is not guilty of one minute sin at all. This is what they do with God. And I remind you, 
We are still living in a world full of depraved and wicked men. Men who despise the Lord Jesus. Men who despise God Himself. Men who despise God even though He is merciful, even though He is gracious, even though He is so benevolent and kind and loving, even though He is willing to save them from their own depravity. This is what wicked and depraved men do with God. I don't want you to miss that. And I don't want you to miss the fact that, that, that even though men's hearts are wicked, even though this is what humanity does with God, Jesus Christ in the gospel can, can change that. Jesus Christ in the gospel can, can make you a new creature in Christ Jesus. And even though what they are doing here is a plot to get rid of the Lord Jesus, Jesus reminds them they're not getting rid of Him. Oh, these are wonderful words. These, these really should have been fearful words for them because of their blindness and, and their own wicked hearts. It doesn't even seem to move them. They just consider it to be blasphemy and a further reason to execute Him and to get rid of Him. But even though they think they're getting rid of Him, Jesus reminds them they are not getting rid of Him because He is eternal. And what he said here about, about destroying the temple of God and building it in three days it really wasn't about lit, what really wasn't literal, but, but Jesus was referring to, him, to his own self. And even though they think they are the ones who are going to execute him, Jesus reminds them that, that and Jesus is going to say further that, that, that no man has the power to take his life. It is Jesus who gives up his life and it, was, and it will be him by the power of God that raises it again. And because Jesus reminds him that he will, that he will be raised again, Jesus reminds us that He will ascend to the right hand of the throne of God and He says, even though that you think you are going to get rid of me, one day you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. What's so interesting about this passage is in their minds, because they hate Him so, because they hate the Lord Jesus, because they despise Him, and because they have rejected Him, they think that this is Jesus' day in court. But Jesus reminds them that they are going to have their day in court. They are going to have their day of judgment. How sad it is that many reject the Lord Jesus. And as I've already said multiple times, the most gracious, merciful, kind and loving being who has ever existed stands here. Not only is He put to the unfair trial, but the Bible says in verse number 67... In verse number 66, that he is guilty of death is what the crowd says, is what the Sanhedrin says. The Bible says that more than that, they spit in his face and buffeted him and others smote him with the palms of their hands. And then they mocked him saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is it he that smote thee? Don't forget what the Lord Jesus endured as He made His way to Calvary. Yes, what Jesus endures on Calvary is terrible and it is awful. But don't forget what He endured leading up to that moment. And we're seeing what John says in his gospel that he was rejected and of it by his own. This is happening here. This is what John is referring to. He came into his own. And this is what his own did because the Bible teaches us that by nature men are sinful and wicked. This is what they do to the Lord Jesus. They spit in his face. They buffet him. And they smote him with the palms of their hands. The unfair trials the unjust trials. Friend, this is what the Lord Jesus has endured for us. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day that you've given us. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come and to preach the Word of God. Lord, it is in your Word that we are reminded of these, uh, this gross mistreatment of the Lord Jesus that took place. But Lord, help us to remember that all of this was taking place 
so that sinful men could be redeemed by your grace, so that we could be justified by faith alone, by grace alone. Lord, Jesus endured what you and I, what, what, what we could never endure. And Father, we are grateful that even though what we are seeing here is dark and grim, there is great light. Because even though He was ultimately executed, He did rise again. And He is sitting now on Your right hand, making intercession for us. Father, thank You for all of this, that it was done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.